All right, guys, this is module five, the scientific method and description. When we're saying description, we're talking about descriptive methods of study. So let's get into it. Okay, so constructing theories. So a theory is an explanation using an integrative an integrated set of principles that organizes observations and predicts behaviors or events. Basically, what that means is, is that a theory takes um, a bunch of observations and applies scientific principles to those observations to create some predictions about behavior. Um, and usually it's been fairly well documented in the observations that it's a little bit more uh, backed than a hypothesis, but it's still not factual. So regardless of how sound a theory might appear, we still have to test it. Like we've talked about again and again and again, theories can sound great and our human brains might want to agree with it, but we always have to test data to be sure to be conclusive. So a good theory should produce testable predictions, which we call hypotheses. So for example, let's say um, you have developed a theory because you have witnessed time and time again that people who get poor sleep tend to do worse on tests. So your theory is that sleep affects memory. Um, your hypothesis needs to be predictable, right? It needs to be something like if a person does not sleep more than five hours a night, then their performance on a test will uh, will suffer versus if they get a full night's rest. So it's very specific and it has to be predict something it can predict and has to be testable. Now, sometimes our own theories can bias how we see the data. Um, meaning, if a person, let's say, believes that uh, only people who sleep well at night will have good grades, if they don't make sure to check themselves on that, a researcher can unintentionally find data to support their idea even when the data doesn't really support their idea. We call this experimenter bias or surveyor bias. So there are a bunch of different um, kind of safety mechanisms that people put in as researchers in psychology research to make sure that that doesn't happen. And one way to check uh, bias is by using operational definitions. Now, it's very important that you understand operational definitions because it's going to come up again and again and again. So an operational definition is a carefully worded statement of the exact procedures or operations used in a research study. So for example, let's say I want to, um, I want to study human intelligence. Well, intelligence is kind of a vague concept. So I need to create an operational definition of it. And my operational definition might be their score on an IQ test. Another example of an operational definition, um, let's say I'm wanting to measure sadness. Well, in order for me to measure sadness, I need to do something that's actually measurable. So let's say I measure the amount of um, times a person cries in a day. That would be an operational definition because I can measure it. And if somebody wanted to replicate my study, they could also measure it. Now, by using these very specific procedures, like I said, the operational definitions, other researchers can then copy these studies or replicate them, um, which is extremely important in psychological science. Basically, if I do a study and I conclude that people who <coughs> sleep less tend to perform worse on tests, and somebody else runs the same study but with different participants and they also get the same results that kind of confirms our theory replication is confirmation we have to have replicability or else a study is basically still kind of a hypothesis it's not really been fully vetted the more it's replicated and confirmed 
the higher validity there is in, um, in a study, which is really important. You want validity. Now, a theory is only useful if it organizes observations, provides predictions that people can test. It has to be testable and stimulate further research or replication studies. That's basically what makes a useful theory. So an unuseful theory, um, which we'll talk about, like Freud's theories, for example, a lot of them are not super useful in our understanding of today's kind of methods because there's no way to test them. Okay, so descriptive studies. Um, now, one method that researchers use when trying to test hypotheses are methods that we call descriptive studies. These are not experiments, okay? Only an experiment is an experiment. Everything else is not. I want you to drill that in your head. So today we're not talking about experiments. We are talking about descriptive studies and there's several different kinds. The first kind is called a case study. And a case study is a descriptive technique where one individual or group is studying in depth in the hope of revealing some universal principles. So for example, they use case studies um, in cases where things are rare, so it's hard to study a large population. So for example, when a person has brain damage, they might um, study them in a case study. S some psychologists in the past have used small groups of individual children to study children's minds and make conclusions kind of about uh, children in general. And animal studies, you can study a small group of animals and um, study them in depth and try to kind of reveal some more generalized principles you can apply to all of that species. <coughs> now, this gentleman here, his name is Phineas Gage. And Phineas Gage is one of the most famous case studies in psychology because what happened was, as you see, he's holding a big railroad spike and you see his eye. Well, what happened was that railroad spike went through his eye up through his brain. And at the time, this is in the 1800s, they didn't know that different brain func brain areas had specific functions. But what happened was is that when Mr. Gage suffered this trauma to his brain, his behavior changed. So this helped stimulate research further into localization of brain functions. Um, and so case studies are really good for that. So sometimes case studies can be very revealing. They can allow us to pursue further research on, on the topic. That's the main goal. It's like, let's try to uncover something that's interesting about this case and see if we can um, create some questions based off of our data that we could actually test later in actual experiments. However, Case studies are not to be taken as evidence um, because one person and their experience does not apply to the masses. And so sometimes atypical individual cases can mislead us. Like, oh, my, my cousin Billy, he had this happen, so it must happen to everyone. No, okay? Um, it's not something we can generalize to the whole population. And like I said, Freud was known for using only case studies to create his theories. That's why they're problematic, because you can't say this principle applies to all humans when you're studying five people. Um, case studies can lead us to further inquiry, but they are not um, conclusive studies that can prove something in and on its own. All right, next is um, naturalistic observation. So naturalistic observation, you've probably all done this. If you've ever people watched, you have done some naturalistic observation. So what this is, is it allows researchers to collect data in natural environments. So for example, one of the most famous is this woman. Um, I'm forgetting her name. She's a famous um, animal researcher, chimpanzees specifically. And she went into the jungle, into their area, and she just sat and watched them and took down data. That's a naturalistic observation. Another example is analyzing parenting behaviors in different cultures. So let's say you go into the middle of a town square 
and you're just watching people and how they're parenting their children. Watching how students sit down in the cafeteria. Who do they sit by? How do they gravitate to those individuals? That's all examples of naturalistic observation. It is hands off. You do not want to intervene with them. That would be a naturalistic observation. Today, social media is becoming a really easy way to conduct naturalistic observations. Um, and s- some research teams have studied the ups and downs of human moods by counting positive and negative words in 504 million Twitter messages from 84 countries. And in the book um, on figure 5.2, what they find based on this naturalistic observation, is that people seem happier on weekends shortly after waking and in the evenings, just based on this data that they have collected. They didn't intervene at all. All they did was make their observations. Now, with this little test, I want you to tell me, what is the operational definition of human mood that they used in this study? Now, one thing to note, naturalistic observation doesn't explain behavior. It doesn't tell us why they're doing these things. All it tells us is what they are doing. And so that's something critical to understand. Only experiments can tell us the why. Um, Everything else can describe what's happening, but can't tell us that underlying factor of why this is happening. Now, naturalistic observation offers interesting snapshots of everyday life, but a big issue with it is that it has no control over the situation. So there are various factors that could be influencing that result, which is why we can't use it to explain behavior. We can only use it to document the behavior. But it still has produced some really interesting things. Like, for example, this this, uh, animal researcher, she found from her research Um, just watching these chimpanzees, that they used tools. And before, it was only thought that humans used tools. Um, And so it can produce some interesting research, but uh, it just can't be used to tell us why that happens. Okay, and then we have the survey. Every single one of you have taken a survey in your life. And a survey is just a descriptive technique that obtains self-reported attitudes or behaviors of a particular group, usually by questioning a representative random sample. So let's say I want to study the students at our school. It would be wise if I used a random number generator to randomly pick, let's say 200 students. Um, to get a good idea of what the student body feels. If I'm only asking kids in leadership class, that would be a biased sample, and we don't want that. So surveys ask participants about tons of different things. Some popular ones are on political opinions, but you know, you could be asked surveys about your religious beliefs. You could be asked surveys about your shopping preferences, what TV shows you like to watch, And the data that they take from that helps inform various different things, businesses, advertisement, um, how to market certain things to people. Now, some interesting survey results have shown in the last, you know, 20 years that across the world, one in five people believe that alien beings, aliens, have come to Earth and now walk among us as humans in disguise. Uh, so that's interesting. Another survey has shown that 68% of all humans, all humans, billions of people say that religion is important in their daily lives. So more than half of us. Very interesting. Now, oops. Okay. So like I mentioned earlier, two problems with surveys are the way a question is worded can change its answer and who is being studied. So first all, first of all, Wording effects. The way you frame a question, this is also called a framing effect. The way you frame a question or word a question can actually change the way a person answers the question. So for example, if I asked you, are you, do you support gun safety versus do you support gun control? These mean basically the same thing. What they find is that people are much more likely to support gun safety versus gun control. 
Similarly, if you ask people, do you support giving aid to the needy? People will say yes. But if you ask them, do you support welfare? They will say no. Literally all that has changed is how the question is worded. The meaning is the same though. So this is another example of our biases that our brain uses that we're not always the most logical beings. Um, so it's important when you're looking at a survey's results to look at how they worded questions because that can definitely change the conclusions that they find. Also, the sampling, the population that they're studying is very important. So something we want to avoid is called sampling bias, which occurs when we use an unrepresentative population and then generalize it to everyone. So like I was saying, if I wanted to study our school and I only polled leadership kids for their opinions on, let's say, dress code, that would be an unrepresentative sample because leadership kids may be fundamentally different than the rest of the school population. That's why our goal is to get a random sample. Now, to get a random sample, first, what you have to do is you have to identify your population. Now, your population is all of the individuals in a group that you want to study, um, and you draw a sample from that population. So like I said, if I want to study the kids at our school, their opinions on dress code, my population would be the students at this school, Clovis North. However, I can't study all 4,000 or some odd students, right? That would just be too difficult. So instead, I'm going to take a sample of that. And the best way to get a good representative sample is to actually do what's called a random sample. And what you do is you use some randomized generator or some other way to randomize it. You could use dice, flip a coin, whatever. Um, and you would choose a group of individuals at random from that population to study. And this is the best way to find results that you can then say this applies to the whole population. Because if you don't do that, then there could be some variables at play that are actually causing the effect or the results versus the actual um, thing you're testing or looking for. So this is a funny little uh, comic. It says, this is sampling bias. And it says, we received 500 responses and found that people love responding to surveys. Okay, so the reason why that's sampling bias is because people who are responding are obviously people who like to do surveys. The people who don't respond are the people who don't like surveys. So that would be a sampling bias. And generally, large random samples around at least a hundred to like a thousand is like the gold standard. That's what you want. So if I wanted to study, let's say, uh, Americans opinions on Biden's presidency so far, I would want at least, at least probably a thousand people and a random sample from people across the country. Okay, now test yourself and we will add some more notes to this in class. So make sure you have some room, maybe in the margins, and I'll see you later. Bye.